Alright, so picking up for where we were yesterday, we are looking at the, uh, the this lunch counter sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, we were saying yesterday that um, there's four black gentlemen from <coughs> Greensboro, North Carolina who want to challenge these lunch counter uh, tabletops uh, nearby from where they are. There's college-age kids, so you see a picture of them right here in this, on the screen. They go sit down at this uh, lunch counter at Woolworths in Greensboro, which was a common department store back in those days. It also had like a lunch counter as well, um, but usually it was for whites only. So the four of them went and sat down at the counter in the whites only section, and then they weren't served all day long. And you can see, like I said, you can see a picture of them sitting there back when this happened. Um, they keep coming back each day to do the same thing, and it generates more and more attention. So as time goes on, uh, people begin to kind of show up on a daily basis to come see this happening and begin to like cause a scene essentially. Well, eventually, because they're violating store policy, you're going to see um, the police eventually come arrest them. So once this occurs, what's going to start happening is that uh, there will be a group of local college-age kids who begin to organize themselves together to begin to try to like replace them and come basically take shifts and come every day to sit at these lunch counters. And so they start to come every day. It generates more and more of a crowd. You can see a picture here where these uh, people in the background are like pouring drinks on them. Um, you know, yelling at them, spitting at them, those kind of things while they're sitting there. And it's whites and blacks doing this. And so this is going to go on for weeks. It's also going to lead to the creation of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. So it's also going to lead to the development of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Yes? Why would white people coordinate? Why was it? It's whites. It's whites. Blacks and whites sitting down. I may have said it wrong, sorry. Blacks and whites sitting down. White guys behind them pouring drinks on them, sorry. You said, you see the picture, they're pouring drinks. Whites and whites. Also, blacks and whites. You have the video. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Sorry for the confusion. Anyway, anyway. So, uh, SNCC formulates as this new group. It's essentially kind of an offshoot of King's group, SCLC. It's also a nonviolent group that only tries to do these types of protests, but in this case, it's made up of what kind of people? Students. College students, right? So these are college-age kids, and it's in the name, too, right? They're doing a nonviolent protest. So they'll keep and maintain this nonviolent protest uh, at least throughout the lunch kind of sit-ins. Well, eventually what ends up happening is that the manager gets tired of all the protests. He eventually takes the seats out. So the seats eventually just get taken out of the lunch counters, but people still keep coming. And so what's going to happen is that there's a lot of pressure put on Woolworths as a national franchise to make a store policy change. So the national uh, company decides that they're going to change their policy to where their counters will not be segregated at stores. And so their protests, their sit-ins were successful and that they actually made change happen. They're going to take this same process of sit-ins and they're going to take it to other places like hotels, restaurants, uh, parks, beaches, libraries, and do these sit-ins. That was kind of their bread and butter to do sit-ins wherever they went to protest whatever was, whatever was happening in those areas. Um, so anyway, so that's essentially where we're going to stop because that's the last year of Eisenhower. Are there any questions about SNCC or the lunch counter sit-ins? No. Okay, but again, nonviolent and college-age kids, okay? Um, so we're moving on, and we'll pick up the rest of the Civil Rights Unit 12. Today we're going to be mostly focusing on the culture of the 1950s. So we're going to mostly be focusing on the culture of the 1950s. Yeah, finally? Okay. So the 50s marked an era of conformity. We've mentioned this before, but conformity was a big, big theme in the 1950s. So conformity was a big, big theme in the 1950s. Um, essentially, this consensus about politics and social issues made you seem more normal, especially in the time of the Red Scare, right? If you were this weirdo or kind of individual, individualistic person who was kind of unusual, people suspect you. Right, and that's why there was a big push for conformity in the 50s because it just made you blend with everybody else, which made nobody think that you were a spy or some kind of other crazy thing. Right. Um, it's also conformity is a huge theme of the 50s. Also, consumerism, just like the 1920s, people in general have a lot more money in the 1950s. We talked about how their income basically tripled in this time period. So that means people are buying a lot more stuff. 
it's also a lot of keeping up with the Joneses type mentality, right? Mentality, right? You have more money, but also you see on the street that the Joneses have uh, a new car. They got these nice appliances. They got a pool. So I what? I need, pool. Pool. I need those same things because it shows that I'm just as good as the Joneses, as the Joneses right? Just as wealthy and as good as they are. So that is um, that. That's kind of the big themes of this, of this decade for television. In the 1950s, t t uh, TV suddenly becomes the center of life for, the, for millions of Americans. Um, it comes out in 1948, 49 time frame, so it comes out late 40s. Not many people had a TV in 1950. Only 9% of households had a TV. And either way, back then, everybody's house had a TV. You didn't have one in each room, like now, or on your phone. Or anything. But you had one TV. Black and white had three channels. That's it. What were the three channels? ABC, NBC, CBS. Because they were originally like all radio broadcasting stations, and they became TV stations. Um, so anyway, by 1960, you have 90% of TVs in homes. I'm sorry, 90% of homes have TVs. So 1960, you have 90% uh, of homes have TVs by that point. And there was a lot of criticism at first. Some thought it was a vast wasteland. There were people who said, Americans don't have time to sit there and watch TV all day. And we proved them wrong, didn't we? Wait, didn't they already like, do that with Sort of, but radio is a little bit different. Where like you can kind of have it on the background, I mean, where it's like TV you gotta like no, plant TV, yourself. TV you can still have it on the. Phone. No, you're right, but I'm saying like there's more like in a, like a radio show you can just listen, kind of do your job, do your work, whatever. Somehow, TV whatever. like you're like trying to see what happens. What? You know, whatever they invented, like the rounding chair, like the lazy boy, was around this time. Probably, yeah. I don't, I don't know. Probably 50s or 60s. I don't know that. That would make sense. Um. <laughs> anyway, so. They have all the same kind of things that you would see on radio or hear on radio, like sitcoms, <coughs> westerns, quiz shows, sports. Uh, you have obviously different like uh, musical shows, variety shows. Yeah, all yeah, all kinds of stuff. So like all basically anything you want on TV, they had it back then as well. Um, but the one thing you want to be aware about TVs too is that. Essentially, they pr uh, promote a very idealized version of society. They promote a very idealized version of society, where it's not very realistic. Essentially, they didn't talk about any of the main controversial issues of the day. They didn't address civil rights. They didn't address really the Cold War at all. They didn't address anything that might, you know, be controversial. Like you see all the shows back then, like I Love Lucy and Leave It to Beaver. All these shows are very wholesome. Whatever conflict is made, it's resolved in 22 minutes, right? <laughs> Little Billy breaks the window, and that's the whole plot line for that story today, right? Oh, Him trying to hide it, that he broke a window or some nonsense. Oh, what we say, whoever. Little Billy, you can't, you can't but anyway, right. that, that's essentially what you see happening in uh, TV, that it doesn't really address real-world problems. There were way more males to females on TV. It's a 3 to 1 ratio. So about 3 to 1 males outnumbered females on TV as well. TV also usually promotes the idea of women in the household. So TV, uh, TV also usually promoted the idea of women in the household. All the sitcoms had the wife at home being a ha homemaker. Kids or no kids. So, so you see a lot of different mediums reinforcing this idea. Any woman you would see like working in a job usually on TV didn't have a husband, which re-emphasizes this idea that you know you basically have to choose career or family. Right. That's it. Uh, minorities are very uh, rarely shown as well, too. Um, if you saw any Latinos or African Americans, they're usually like in some kind of service role on TV, but that's about it. Like one rare exception is uh, is Desi Arnaz, the husband of Lucille Ball, who who played opposite her in the show. But very few people of minority or ethnic backgrounds were able to actually be on prominent roles in TV back then. Um, also, you see it where like they don't try to do like realistic violence. Like they didn't do any kind of like modern day cop shows. The most violent shows you'd see on TV were like westerns. That was very very common back then. Was a lot of westerns. So like if you have grandparents who love watching westerns, the reason why is because when they were kids, that's all that came on TV was westerns. Like that was the action show of the fifties. Psycho was the first yeah. movie to show like blood. Right. Everybody freaked out about it. And that was in 1960, right? Yeah, like Bonanza. Bonanza, yes, yeah, 50s and 60s. So, like, yeah, it's all, yeah. Um, 
Brawl High, there's all kinds of shows like Brawl that. High. First cartoon. I mean, here's what you're asking: first TV cartoon or first like car? Because like Mickey Mouse is back to the 20s and movies and stuff like that. Both playing the same thing. But TV cartoons, I'm not sure what exactly would be your first TV. But Felix Cat goes back to movies too. I don't know the first I TV it, cartoon. The first TV cartoon. Was Crusader Rabbit. There you go. It was definitely Crusader Rabbit. Okay. No, Felix is older than, than that. All right. Anyway, so that's TV. Be aware of how it promotes these very stereotypical ideas. Okay. Then you have paperbacks and records. In spite of TV, Americans are reading more than ever. People were still reading and consuming a lot of normal stuff. A lot of like newspapers, magazines, Reader's Digest was very big in the 1950s. <clears throat> Paperbacks sold about a million copies a day back then. So a lot of cheap reads. A lot of cheap reads were selling very well back in the 1950s. What do we have selling now? Do you think? I have no idea. Because now you have ebooks, so it's a lot different now. You can Google it. Ten. Ten. Yeah, I mean, you also have a computer in front of you. You can look at this up. So people are still reading. Then you have records and music. Records also make help to make music very consumable. You already had record players before this, but in the 1950s you had what's now called a 45. A 45 is like these little small records that would have a song on each side, which means they're cheaper and a, a, a kid like your age would have enough money to go buy one. So they can go buy all the hot songs of the day and go buy a little 45 record and listen to the songs. Um, but it made it very easy to access things like rock and roll or, what, or whatever else they were into listening at that time. And so music, and again, this is just like before, it's a homogenization of society, right? Mm -hmm. That you're able to access music no matter where you are in the country and able to make, basically have a common culture in America as a result too. So in this decade, you have rock and roll emerge as this new unique format of music. Uh, just like with jazz in the 1920s, what will rock and roll be for the 50s? Rebellion, right? It's for young kids. Young kids get really into rock and roll, and so it's an act of rebellion against their parents. It sings. They usually sing about things they care about: falling in love, driving fast cars, not wanting to do what your parents want you to do. Those kind of things, right? So they sing about these kind of uh, topics that really got into the uh, got to the kids. So like now, rap music is like. Right, like the modern day rock and roll. But even now, it's not really rap so much. It's rap is mixed in with a lot of different, like, you know, modern pop, hip hop stuff. It's not really just like, back in the 80s, it was like rap and then everything else, right? And now rap is like mixed in more. Exactly. <laughs> now it's part of the culture, right? But anyway, yeah, so rock and roll is, um, is, is an act of rebellion and very controversial. You see a lot of big acts emerge in the 1950s, like Elvis Presley, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. Uh, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Bill Head of the Commons, Ray Charles. The way rock and roll operated is that it mixed in a lot of different genres. It mixed in African American rhythm and blues, as well as like country music. What's probably the key ingredient here is electrical instruments. The fact that you have now electric guitars, that's really the key ingredient here to make it rock and roll. And at first you look at some of these early bands, like some of these early bands have like a huge band, like a bunch of horns and stuff. Still, and all that will eventually go away by the 60s for the most part, which is you know, instruments and the singers. But um, you see a lot of these early artists kind of cross genres a lot. Like, you look at a lot of the early Elvis albums, Elvis has like Christian songs, he's got country songs, he's got rock and roll songs. You just described Katy Perry. Nope. This is also true, but she also <laughs> she used the backdoor way to get into music. She became a Christian singer first, and then used that to like pave her way into pop music. Yeah. Katie Swift. Katie Swift. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift's even worse example. Of that. Yeah. <laughs> she faked Taylor all Swift. accents. Elvis stuff. Presley. Exactly. No, it's not so. No. She does at least write her own song, so I'll give her that. She was just trying to like. She just wanted to get paid. She wants money. It's all about dollars. She came from a rich. She came from a rich family, y'all. All right. Anyway, erroneous, erroneous. Okay. Anyway, a lot of these early people, like Ray Charles, Elvis Presley, they had a lot of cross genre uh, albums and songs back then. But like you said. It was an act of rebellion. It was cheap to consume because of records being cheap, but a lot of young people were very much into rock and roll back in those days. All right, advertising. 
So, in all media, TV, radio, newspapers, there's a lot more aggressive ads. You have TV now, right? So you can play what? Commercials, Commercials right? Now you have ads on like papers and stuff now. Now you also have ads on television. So there's a lot more aggressive advertising, targeted advertising. You obviously would probably play a lot of pro-women ads during the daytime to try to get them to buy things or be convinced to buy certain things. And it's also trying to get into your psychology. Like you see right here, married, no reason to neglect your stockings, right? So if you're at home all day being a homemaker, you should still dress up and wear stockings even if you never leave the house, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, this is tricky, right? If, the, if you have a housewife, she wouldn't usually get dressed up necessarily, so you gotta convince them that they need to buy stockings and wear them even if they're at home all day, right? So what do we do Just, you know, tidying up, maybe have a day, a lunch with the girls that day. Who knows, right? Garden a little bit. Go garden outside. Cry at home. Yeah, that's, that's in the committed no, I know, I know, I know. Yes, this is also true. It is? Uh, it is. She's right. All right, anyway. A lot of shopping uh, centers begin to develop. Like, you see the first, like, shopping malls. Like, uh, Baton Rouge gets his first shopping mall in the 1960s at Bon Marche, which is not there anymore. Um, it's where the giant Cox building is on Florida's, Florida Boulevard. Um, they also had the first credit card come out. So the first credit card that comes out in the 50s, it was called the Diners Club card, followed closely behind by the American Express card. But now you begin to see people having credit cards to be able to buy items they want to buy. You see a lot of franchise uh, built, uh, businesses and restaurants like McDonald's. Like Ray Kroc does not create McDonald's. He buys it out and he franchises it. So what he decides to do in every store is that every McDonald's, they do the exact same thing. It's structured the same way. They make the food the exact same way no matter where you go. And it grows because of that reason, because they're fast and because you know exactly what you're going to get when you walk in there. Doesn't mean it's good. It just means you're going to get what you expect when you walk in, right? They don't do that anymore. No, I, I don't know if you ever had like a good time, but I guess it's probably better relatively than now, but still. No, I'm just saying Fast food, burgers, and those kind of no, things. I'm just saying like they have like different stuff wherever you go in the country. Like they might have some that kind of store. Well, yeah, but you still like the first number one through seven is like the same thing. Right. So that's not, I mean like most of the stuff. Yeah, Big Mac and all that stuff. Um, but you see here, like that's, this is what a store looked like back then. Like it was very standardized and so on. But but again, all this is about homogenization, conformity. No matter where you go and where where you travel, you see the same shows, similar restaurants. People becoming more and more the same throughout the, uh, the United States. Um, so all this helps to standardize the nation. Then you have corporate America. Corporate America does a lot for conformity. So you see the rise of a lot of corporations and a lot of conglomerates in the 1950s. A lot of conglomerates and corporations developed in the 1950s as well. Um, a lot of white collar jobs. And For the first time in American history, you're gonna have more white collar jobs than you do blue collar jobs. So we're transitioning away from an industrialized country to more of this office-oriented corporate world and again, that reflects back on the suburban growth, right? If 60% of Americans live in the suburbs, chances are, does that mean most of them are going to be working in a factory? No. Probably not. Well, some will, but not much, probably not a lot of those guys. Especially if they're driving back and forth every day, yes? Um, white collar is like standard middle class work, or is that blue collar? It means like you're at a desk working, like you're not getting yourself dirty. So like you're at a desk working, salary job. Like construction work. Right, fiscal labor job, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, but so you have a lot of businesses developing like food processing, hotels, transportation, insurance, and banking. For example, Disney's an example of a conglomerate. Disney has its movies, but it also has TV shows, it has theme parks, it has merchandising. It has a lot of different items that it does. It doesn't just do one thing, right? Like McDonald's does or something like that. So that's a conglomerate. Um, conglomerate, it's pretty much like it sounds. C O N G. L O M O, yeah, rate, R A T E S. Um, so more people are coming white collar jobs now, too. 
most companies are also now promoting conformity. They don't want any kind of individuality. They want you to be a team player and come in and help the company grow. Don't express really any individuality. They have a dress code. They also have a dress code where they all wear the same. Like you see them all wearing the same kind of suits, hats, dressing alike, looking the same. William White's book, The Organization of Man, William White's book, The Organization of Man, documented this loss of individuality. See, The Organization of Man documents a lot of this loss of individuality and how men dress and how they want to work and the same things. Even like the ladies being the house housemakers, because they usually would visit each other in the daytime, they get dressed up and they basically dress in the same kind of stuff. Makeup, jewelry, dresses, stockings, heels. Right, they all people dress the same, right? Because that means you're a dirty communist, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Then for religion, uh, organized religion expands dramatically after World War II. So organized religion expands dramatically after World War II, with thousands of new churches and synagogues. So they have thousands of new churches and synagogues popping up. After World War II, thousands of uh, new churches and synagogues popped up after World War II. Um, what you also see kind of happen now by this point is that we don't really care that much anymore about if you're Catholic or Protestant or whatever. The fact, you know, for a long time that was a big deal, and that's not really a big deal anymore. So there's a book of this called Protestant Catholic Jew by William Herbert or Will Herbert that talks about how there's a lot more general tolerance of religion now in America. That we don't really care that much about what variety you are as much anymore. One of the reasons is that people weren't that into their doc as much as they used to be. Like they weren't that, you know, hardcore or whatever they were. But you are seeing a general ancient interest in religion. Religious membership became a source of identity as well in the 1950s. Um, the okay. Then you have uh, women's roles. We've mentioned this to some degree already. The baby boom and running the household because uh, you were the housewife made homemaking a full-time job. So everything reinforced the idea of like, you being in the household. Movie, TV, uh, radio, all kinds of advertising, all forced that the wife's place was in the home taking care of. Whether you had kids or not, essentially. That's your role was at home uh, doing this. Um, and so, the po in the post era, we also talked about the book before too, Dr. Vince Fox's Baby and Child, uh, Baby and Child Care, how it re-emphasized the same idea that he believed that the mom raising the kid was crucial. You have this mom at home raise the kid, not with a daycare, not with somebody else, or else develop correctly. Well, another man telling what he wants to Exactly. Well, you need to help a little bit, I guess. Do we? Do we? Do we? Right, exactly. The snake took the apple and you did so. <laughs> Case proven. Case proven. Strike two. Alright. Um, so, at the same time, at the same time that you have a growing dissatisfaction. This is time you have a growing dissatisfaction with women at home. So, and this is something we're talking about in year 12, that a lot of women are living very unfilled lives because essentially they go to school until they get married. And then once they get married, they go and they work at home too. For the rest of for the rest of their life. So it's one of those things like they feel very unfilled because it's like it's all there is in life. That am I supposed to be this housewife anything more and I can never do anything greater? Which is what the book says she's reading the mistakes about, right? Depression rate increased. Depression has increased. Right? So, this is a growing problem with lots of uh, housewives in the 1950s. Or just, this is going to eventually be addressed in the 60s, which we'll talk about this year. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Anyway, um, but do you see a general increase of women in the workforce in the 1950s? Yes. There are more women working in 1960s than 1950s. Now, again, this is not every woman or the majority. You are seeing a general trend of women entering the force more, more in spite of TV and everything else. Them, but their role is more okay. Okay. Right. 
This is uh, some social critics. So not Arab drank the cool aid. There were people who criticized uh, how society was, who did criticize the conformity and the consumerism. So there were some people who criticized the conformity and the criticism. For example, geologist David Run wrote a book, The Lonely Crowd. So they were writing this book, Lonely Crowd, that cri criticized the lack of individuality society's notion of conformity. So like, the lonely crowd was causing the lack of individuality. It's not a novel, this is like a non-fiction book since by a sociologist, but he criticized society and how losing individuality and trying to promote more conformity. So he's an example of non-fiction to a critic. Anything for the affluence of John Galbraith He's a prominent economist. In fact, he's actually under J. and LBJ in their positions. But Rafe wrote this book, Affluent Society, where he wrote about the failure of wealthy society to address the need for social spending for the common good. So he's an economist who wrote about the failure of wealthy society to address the need for social spending for the common good. Basically, he wanted to point out, hey, there's like 40 Americans who are in poverty. And people aren't doing anything about it. And he believed the government's roles do something like the government step in more for housing, do more soul giving programs, help them work their way out of poverty and have their life than what they have. So he points out how society is not helping out people in poverty enough and the government should step in. And like I said, he'll be hired by the LBJ to involved in administrations. Um, there are also other authors who comment about how corporates have a dehumanizing effect on us as well because it makes it cog like the system type thing. Alright, uh, fiction for novels. Um, the more popular fictional novels in the 50s of The Catch and Light by Jay Sir. What's it about, you know? It's about this boy. It's about that keeps him at least sorry. Because he doesn't try, so he he runs away for some more. And like, I don't know, look like, like he does trust adults because I think you're more like so he's all adults phony. Right. So that's in the he basically is that everybody is a phony, that they're all thick, they're not realistic. And that's why this is all of us are criticizing the authenticity. That the people just come kind of act all the same and act be clear with the case. I mean, big thing with, well, we'll come in a second, but like, that's just what he's talking about. 22 is another that comes out to one by Joller. Uh, this is sad time the military in the city of war. They're about to make uh, some minis on it, I think, Blue or George. Blue or Amazon, too. Um, Cash 22 says satirization like the military and how it was done. It had a reflection of the war in the time period, too. The only real expanditures is the use of the word war, and that's the reason. Ice blocks are used for war. Consumer. 
They go E fly in. The most work of this Acura on the road. So, what this guy is promoting, you know, he comes out for a conference. He doesn't really want to do what he wants to do, what he represents. Deciding what, like, you know, go have a job, part of the system. Decides just to kind of take off, like, just to go off the road to find himself for a while. And that's kind of just like, there's so much from society, from society, that should. Now, it basically might be married, job, and what you're going to do for your life by five years old. And the pressure still seems now. Is there anything really wrong with taking it off for like going to the job I <laughs> But it's not a lot of soul stick. Like, if you don't acknowledge it when 18, 19 old, there'd be a problem, right? And that's what kind of basically that you don't have to know what you want to be by. Maybe you should talk life and like figure what it is that you like to do in your life. Five is exact. That's the beat generation. Again, these are all the rebellion or prison houses. Okay, what's that? Absolutely. Duck and cover. So a very dominant thing back in school in the 1950s was the duck cover uh PS did inside schools. Where they literally folk would tell you to like get it as a duck in case I make ball of your body. So you're like get it as pink cover kissing your body because that test is gonna do you. Because it's a cover thing. It's a tornado coming to this. I'm getting the whole thing. The right now. If the animal are away enough, sure, maybe. Right? But if you have grounds in your head, oh, right? I'm surprised. I'll be here once you just. It's done. Right? I'll be in a tech bag to the um, cool warrior. Come play for the parts of our team and we'll be in a class here. Back up and send it over. Oh, 
Say no always.